Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners, they are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Read Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Read Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Read Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodion. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphina and Tryphosa. Greet beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, and Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Thus far, God's holy inerrant and inspired word growing up ellen kelly was never allowed to play her aunt nora's piano but when aunt nora passed and ellen had the opportunity she bought that piano for 25 dollars at an estate sale when she got the piano home and began to play it she noticed that it it didn't sound quite right it sounded funny she played the piano she knows what they're supposed to sound like and and something was off so she opened it up like popped the lid and began poking around and she discovered the culprit there were papers in the piano or what looked like papers upon a closer inspection they looked like playing cards but then they turned out to be something else entirely It was a collection of 110 vintage baseball cards that were making the trouble in her aunt's old piano, including an authentic and pristine Babe Ruth rookie card, which she later sold for over $100,000. Ellen Kelly found a treasure in an unlikely place, and I hope that is what happens to us today. This morning, we are looking at Romans 16, 1 to 16, which at first glance seems rather unspectacular. And in many respects, it is unspectacular. Greco-Roman letters often ended with these sorts of greetings. It was a normal or a formal part of an ancient letter. And you can find them in almost every New Testament letter in your Bible. But this personal greeting is far from ordinary. I want you to think about it like you would a genealogy in Genesis. There's always more here than meets the eye. There's a Babe Ruth rookie card hiding in this piano behind the hammers and the strings. And maybe more than one. And I'm excited this morning to lift the lid with you to poke around and see what we discover. Before we begin, let's pray and ask the Spirit's help and blessing. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the doctrine of inspiration. We thank you that as believers we can turn to this letter and we can read a personal greeting knowing that this too is your word to us. Lord, at first glance it, it may seem relatively insignificant, particularly in light of the glories that we've seen in Romans 3 or 4 or 5 or 8 or even 12, 13, 14, and 15. But this is your word to us, O Lord. And we know and believe that there are treasures here just below the surface. So we pray, O Spirit, that you would take this personal greeting and give us new eyes to see it. We pray that you would give us new eyes to see what it means to be a church member, a part of a church, and to serve you, O Lord, with other people. We ask that you would bless this time, bless your word, for Jesus' sake, amen. Well, the first thing we need to do is get to know the piano, get to know this personal greeting. And like I said a minute ago, this is normal, this is typical. You find them in almost every Greco-Roman letter of personal correspondence. What's different about this one, as opposed to the other ones in your Bible, is that this is the longest. It's the longest because It's the only one written to an audience Paul had never met. It's the only one where the author didn't actually know the people he was writing to. And so he takes extra pains here 
to express His goodwill to them and to make personal connections. We do this all the time when we meet new people. Right? We, we meet somebody we don't know and we say, well, hey, do you know so-and-so? And they say, yeah, I know so-and-so. Do you know so-and-so? Well, yeah, I know so-and-so. Do you know so-and-so? Yeah, I know so-and-so. Well, Paul is doing that. He's pointing out personal connections that he has with members in that church who also know him to help build that relationship, to express goodwill, and also, I think, to, to give them a reason a personal reason to take his strong letter, his bold reminder more seriously. When you look at this greeting, it's remarkable. There are nearly 30 names here, and each name has a story to tell. And I want to draw your attention to just a few of them. And they are good. First, I want you to meet the mailman. Or should I say the male woman? You can find her in verses 1 to 2. Do you see the patron? It's a woman named Phoebe. In fact, many of our oldest manuscripts of the book of Romans actually have a superscription at the beginning that tell us that this letter was delivered uh, from Paul by Phoebe. She brought it to Rome. That's likely the case. And if that is the case, which I think it is, these two verses serve as a letter of introduction from Paul. It's a very important thing. We have photo IDs. We have text messaging and calling. How could you authenticate that she really is from the Apostle Paul and not some imposter? Well, it's things like this. This letter of recommendation or letter of commendation at the beginning of this list that would do that very thing. And Paul tells us a number of things about her. All of them instructive. First, he calls her sister. She's a believer. She's actually an unmarried or widowed believer. Because no husband here is named. Now, I think we can just stop right here and think for a moment. Are you single? Are you unmarried or widowed or divorced? There's work for you in Christ's church. It may seem like sometimes that's not the case. Right? We, we, we talk about families. One of the burdens of this church, I think, is we want to strengthen families. That's something that the elders feel very passionately about. We want to see families in this church strengthened. But as we stress that and as we emphasize that, do not hear, never hear, there's no place for the singled, the widowed, the divorced, the unmarried. That is not the case. Tell me, what was the author's marital status? Single. And what was the author's patron or missionary or emissary's marital status. Single. There is much work for singles to do in that church, in Chincrea, and here in this church. If you are single, let me invite you to join the noble order of Phoebe and take your place beside her along with other singles and serve. She was a sister. Number two, she was a patron. In other words, she's wealthy. She has money. She provided financial assistance. Paul literally says that she was a helper of many as well as myself, and so you ought to help her. And again, this is just a reminder that Phoebe is probably one of the best examples in the Bible of what a wealthy Christian ought to be and do. You know, Paul talks about wealthy Christians in 1 Timothy. He says, let those who are rich be rich in what? In good works. Be generous and ready to share. You know, friends, in a, in a majority blue-collar church like ours, believe it or not, whether we say it or not, it's tempting and easy to look down on the rich and think of them as less spiritual than us. Sometimes we have to, to examine these unquestioned assumptions. Are, are the rich less spiritual on account of their riches? Not necessarily. And are the poor more spiritual on account of their poverty? Not necessarily. It is your devotion to Jesus, not your net worth, that makes you more godly or less, more spiritual or less, more holy or less. She was a sister. She was a patron. And now we have to say she was, in the Greek, a diakonos. 
a diakonos. That's the Greek word hiding behind the English word servant. And many of your Bibles probably have a footnote by that word servant right there that reminds you that the word there is actually deacon. Yikes. Let's talk about this for a minute. We need to talk about this for a minute. The big question is, everybody agrees that that word is diakonos, but the big debate is, what does it mean? Was she merely a servant of the church of Chincrea, or was she some sort of female deacon serving in the church of Chincrea? It's an interesting question, and it's a timely question. We are no longer part of the SBC, but the SBC, which we once were a part of, and which many of us love, is being torn apart over the issue, even now, by the question of women in ministry. So we need to be able to think about this issue in a sane way, in a biblical way. And let me tell you what I think this means. And here's what I think it means. I think it's fairly clear that Phoebe was some sort of unordained female deacon. And I believe that's the case for four reasons. So listen to me, please. Number one, 1 Timothy 3.11 seems to identify... This class of worker, unordained female deacons. Literally, Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.11, the women likewise. Number two, the designation diakonos of the church of Chincrea suggests an official title of some sort. Number three, the use of the masculine noun diakonos, not diakona, suggests some sort of office was intended. If you want to talk about gender, in his relationship to nouns, talk to Ms. Donna later on today if you can find her. It's also worth noting that the early church routinely appointed seven male deacons and seven female deacons every time they founded a church. They did so because they thought that's what was required by Acts chapter 6. And this has no problem. This would be unobjectionable so long as you don't confuse the office of the elder with the office of the deacon. What is the task of the deacon in the New Testament? To care for the physical needs of the church. And there were just some situations in the early church where it would be inappropriate for a male deacon to serve the physical needs of a single woman, for example. Now, you know, as we talk about that and explain this in a world without hospitals, without um, urgent care clinics and those sorts of things without nurses, very few doctors. It's not revolutionary or liberal. It's miles away from anything remotely associated with feminism. It's just common sense. Was Calvin a feminist? Was Tyndale? Was Bunyan? Were the Puritans? Were our Baptist forefathers feminists? No, of course not. And they were all proponents of some form of an unordained female deacon. That's what I think it means. That's why I believe what I do. Now, let me be absolutely clear. And hear me when I tell you. Hear me when I tell you that I am not, I am not advocating that we appoint deaconesses. Can I say that again? I am not advocating, not, N-O-T, advocating that we appoint unordained female deacons. Not at all. And I'll tell you why. One, that would simply be too confusing in our world. That would seem to suggest to the outside world that we are making a stand that we are not making. It would seem to communicate that we were egalitarian in our outlook on ministry, and we are not. Furthermore, we don't need them. And why is that the case? Because we have so many wonderful Phoebes in our midst. We have so many women in our church who are currently doing that work without the title. There's a third reason. I I want you to know something about this debate. This issue, whatever Phoebe is or is not, has no bearing, hear me, no bearing on the question of female ministers, preachers, elders, or pastors. And I don't want us to get lost in this debate and miss how remarkable Phoebe was. Whatever she was, she was a godly, faithful, wealthy believer who did great things for Christ and His church. Note the mailman. 
Secondly, note the power couple. Do you see them? Here we come to, to one of the most famous married couples in the entire Bible. Certainly one of the most famous married couples outside of the New Testament after Mary and Joseph. And that is Priscilla and Aquila. We know more about their lives than most of the apostles understand. We first meet them in the book of Acts. They were some of those Jewish believers in Rome. They got kicked out when Claudius expelled the Jews. They ended up in Corinth. And Paul, on his second missionary journey, ended up there as well. And while Priscilla and Aquila were in Corinth, and when Paul was in Corinth, the two met. They discovered that they both loved Jesus and that they both shared a trade, and that is tent making. So Paul moved in with them and worked together with them in the gospel and in tent making. Not long after that, this couple made its way to Ephesus. So think from Greece to Turkey. They get to Ephesus and they set up shop there and they begin to teach and work. And they meet a young man named Apollo. Now Apollo is a remarkable figure in the, in the book of Acts. He is this gifted, strangely gifted preacher. But we read that there was something wrong with his teaching. What was it? We don't know. But do you remember what Priscilla and Quilla did? Both of them took him aside and showed him a more excellent way. Isn't that remarkable? Just to, just to stop and think about. I mean, we live in a day where it's so easy and so common to burn others down. To cancel, to condemn, to criticize. You'd be surprised how many people eat roast preacher and roast sermon every Sunday for lunch. But not this couple. Was there something defective in Apollo? Yes. Did they burn him down for it? No. They took him aside, the two of them, and began to show him a more excellent way. And so this excellent preacher with some problems became an excellent preacher without problems. Some believe that Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews. And if that's the case, could it be that this power couple helped share some of these new covenant insights to this remarkable gifted teacher in Ephesus? Maybe so. Maybe as Russell and his class is studying, it's remarkable to think about this, as they're studying the book of Hebrews, they may be reading Apollo. And if they're reading Apollo, they may be reading Priscilla and Aquila. If you're a couple here today, may I speak to you? If you're a couple here today, can I ask you a question? Do you have a vision for family ministry? Right? It, it's very common for us as married people that the husband does one thing, the wife does another, but they don't do anything together. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong for a husband to do one thing and a wife to do another. I'm not saying that at all. But I do think it would be good and helpful and thoughtful for you to think about what you could do together. Well, see, whenever you see Priscilla in this Bible, who else do you see? Aquila. They're always together. They're a tag team. Where you find one, you always find the other. Now, that might be a simple accident of history, but I doubt it. Notice what Paul says about them. They serve together. Paul calls them both, my fellow workers, plural. They suffer together. They risk their necks, plural, for my life. They were honored and appreciated together. He said, whom not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles. Remember, they are Jews, by the way. This Jewish couple, all the Gentiles give thanks. And they showed hospitality together. Greet also the church in their house. Married couple, if you're looking for a way to start a ministry together, hospitality might be the most easy way to do it. Think about it. Right? There's no way if you have people in your home to just let the husband or the wife do it. You're going to get found out. right? Your guests are going to find you and you're going to get sucked into to getting to know them and talking to other people. It's a wonderful thing to do. right? In hospitality, both husband and wife have to be involved. It's inevitable. Unless one runs away and hides. And that's really hard to do with company, especially if your company has kids. So if you're looking for a place to start, let me encourage you, show hospitality together. That's not really a suggestion, that's a command. Not a command from me, but from Paul, who told us in 12, 13 to do what? Seek to show hospitality. And guess who, and guess married couples, what's a great group to show hospitality to? The singles in this church. It's a great thing to do, a great way to, to serve the Lord together and to show love and 
agape to your other single brothers and sisters here. Great way to start a family ministry. Note the power couple. Third, note the ladies. There are a lot of them in this list. Did you notice? There are about nine of them. And this is an extremely important text when it comes to the ministry of women in the church. And it has nothing to do with Phoebe, by the way. It has everything to do, not with Phoebe, but with 1 Timothy 2.12. That lovely verse that says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to ma- remain quiet. That verse ruffles feathers. Don't believe me? Just share it with somebody sometime. That verse goes against the grain of our modern sensibilities. And that verse, some say, is proof positive that Paul was a patriarchal, sexist, misogynist. Sadly, we need to admit this, some bad men, some bad men, some bad men have taken this good verse and done terrible things with it. Some bad men have have taken this very good verse and used it to justify attitudes and practices that the Bible clearly condemns. I want you to hear something else. Paul excludes women from exercising spiritual authority in the church, not because, not because, not because they are untalented, unintelligent, unwise, and too emotional. You hear me? It's not because of that. It's also worth remembering, men and women, that not all men are qualified for spiritual authority in the church simply because they are men by virtue of their gender. No, 1 Timothy 2.11 needs to be understood in light of creation on the one hand, Genesis 2 and 3, or 1, 2, and 3, and in light of Romans 16, 1 to 16. You know, you, you would think, by the way people react to 1 Timothy 2.12, that the Apostle Paul had no place whatsoever for women to serve in church, right? Paul's women's ministry philosophy would be cover up, sit down, listen up, and shut up. How many people would probably think about, if you read 1 Timothy 2.11, that's how many people would think that um, that would be Paul's ministry of philosophy, a philosophy of ministry for women's ministry, but not according to Paul. Look at the women who are described in verse 16. Phoebe, a servant of the church and a patron of the apostles. Priscilla, a a risk, a neck-risking fellow worker. Mary, a hard worker. Junia, a fellow prisoner known among the apostles. Paul says that Rufus' mother has been a, a mother to me. Here we have a small army of female Christian workers and the language of labor, co-laborer, and danger probably indicates that they were engaged in dangerous missionary work. Friends, Paul is not contradicting himself in 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy, excuse me. He hasn't changed his mind. Hear me. It is possible For women to serve the Lord in all sorts of ways without exercising spiritual authority in the church. It's not just possible, it's expected, it's commanded, it's required. We see the same thing in our Lord's own ministry, do we not? Faithful women followed Him as well as men. In fact, they're the ones, not the men, who often show the greatest faith in the gospel. Think of the woman with the issue of blood. Think of the anointing at Bethany. Think of the women at the foot of the cross. Think of the women who discover the empty tomb. Hear me, friends. It's not an either-or situation. Either women must be pastors or they can do nothing in the church. It's not that dichotomy. It's a false dichotomy. There are all sorts of ways for women to serve in Christ's church without being a pastor, elder, minister, or leader. So the next time someone calls you, or a Christian who believes in 1 Timothy 2.11, something terrible, point them to Romans 16, and ask them to point out to you one woman in this list whose spiritual gifts and talents are being wasted because they're not a pastor. They won't be able to find one. Note the faithful number of women. Note the number of faithful women in this passage. 
We also need to note the men. That's the fourth thing I want you to see. I know it seems a bit counterintuitive at first glance, but bear with me. There are two ways to look at gender in Romans 16. One is to notice all those faithful female workers listed in this greeting in a male dominated Roman context. That is a remarkable thing to do. One is to notice how many faithful Christian women are serving Christ that Paul mentions. But there's another way to look at this, and I want to challenge our men to to take this perspective here for a moment. It's also remarkable to note how many faithful male workers exist within this church context. And why do I say that? I say that because we're Baptist. And Baptists historically have more female members than male members. Look at our church. Do a head count here today. You'll see that probably borne out. I say that because I'm a pastor, not just because I'm a Baptist. Because it's far more common to see wives at church without their husbands than to see husbands without their wives. I say this because I know that the third most highly attended Sunday of the year is Mother's Day. And the worst attended Sunday of the year is Father's Day. When women, godly women, Christian women, women who are professing Christians have their special day, they want their family to come to church with them. Many husbands, when it's their special day, want to be exempt from going to church altogether. Tell me, who often signs up most to volunteer? Who leads most of our ministry teams? Who brings the meals? Sends the flowers? Sends the cards. Generally speaking, it's not the men. There are nine women represented on this list of 26 or 28. That means 17 are men. That's two-thirds. That's 66%. Now, I know, hear me, I know that Romans 16 is not a perfect representative sample of the church in Rome. Therefore, it's hard to make hard and fast judgments about men and women from it. And I know, I get it, that this isn't Paul's purpose in this greeting, primarily, anyway. But I also know this, that nine-tenths, or let me say 99 one-hundredths. Now let me go up. Let me say 999 one-thousandths. All the confusion, that's what I'm trying to say, all, almost all the confusion that the evangelical church has about gender roles in evangelical churches, All of our confusion, 99.9% of it, would be cleared and dispelled if men would lead in prayer and praise and service. When was the last time you knew a church that had too many male volunteers? I don't know of any. When have we had too many men volunteering to pray on a Sunday morning? Oh, for the day that we would have to cap numbers Five, six, seven, or eight, or nine, or ten. Now I know we do better than many churches in our community. I think we do. So what? Right? Are we saying something if we are the most mature kindergartner? What sort of honor is it to be the healthiest sick person in the hospital? Brothers, this isn't a new problem you understand. I'm not trying to be excessively or fussy hard on us. This isn't a new problem. In 1851, J.C. Ryle said this about church life in London. It is fearful to observe the immense preponderance of women over men in almost every church. Where are the men? No doubt there are bright exceptions to these statements, but they are unhappily few and far between. This isn't just a a London and 1851 problem. This is a Genesis 3 problem. After the fall, it's natural. It feels good and normal for men like you and me to abdicate our spiritual authority and say, hey, honey, you take it. And it's natural and normal after the fall for women to say, sure, honey, no problem. The fall turns everything upside down, especially gender roles, especially gender roles in the home, especially gender roles in the home and in the church where spiritual authority is involved. 
See, that's the great thing about redemption. What happened in the fall is turned right side up through Christ. And that's where Paul grounds 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 in Genesis 1 and 2. That's the logic of church order in 1 Timothy 2 because that's the logic of church order in Genesis 1 and 2. Friends, let us be, men, the bright exception. So when visitors come and worship with us, they never ask, where are the men? Because they see where the men are. They are leading in prayer and praise and service. Let that be a challenge to us. Note the men. Note fourthly, or excuse me, fifthly, the importance of friendship. You really get that from this passage, I think. Read the book of Acts. In the end of most of Paul's epistles, you will make a startling discovery. Paul was almost never alone. Almost never alone. He constantly surrounded himself with friends. Some of these friends we know quite well. Some of these friends wrote books of the Bible. Luke, Timothy, Titus, Barnabas. Some of these men we don't know very well. Lucius, Jason, Jason and Sociopater, who we'll meet next week. But one thing is clear. Paul always surrounded himself with Christian friends. This is hardly surprising since the ancients valued friendship far more highly than we do. The most important book on ethics probably ever written outside of the Bible was Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. And he talks about friendship more than any other subject in that remarkable book. He says that a friend, be it that friendship is a great virtue, and he describes a friend as another self. He said friendship is most necessary for our life, for no one would choose to live without friends, even if he had all the goods in this life. Friendship, he argues, is possible only between people of similar virtue, and his description of friendship is remarkably similar to Paul's definition of agape love. Think of the Bible. Think of some of the great saints in the Bible. Think of some of the great saints that that Russell's class is studying in Hebrews 11. Abraham had friends like Mamre. Moses had Aaron and Joshua. David had Jonathan and this tight-knit group of mighty men. Daniel, who we studied about last year, had his companions. Christ had his apostles. Paul had an army of friends. Church history is filled with Similar examples, Augustine surrounded himself with a a community of brothers. Luther had Melanchthon. Calvin had Veray and Pharrell. Bunyan had Owen. Cooper had Newton. Lewis had the Inklings. We've been reading through the 18th century on Wednesday nights, some of us, and we we read a book between a, a debate about Wesley and Whitfield, actually a debate they were engaged in, and they fought hard, extremely hard. They they disagreed profoundly. But listen to what Wesley says about his friend Whitfield in the funeral sermon that he preached for him. Look at what he says. Should we not mention that he had a heart susceptible of the most generous and most tender friendship? I have frequently thought this, of all others, was the distinguishing part of his character. What a great question. Do you have a heart susceptible? Are you easily sucked in to really generous and tender friendship oh that we would be friends don't underestimate the importance of friends can i speak to the young folks here today young folks where are you right look at me this is important can i speak to the old folks in here today it's important for you too and everybody in between friends can do immense harm or they can do immense good Ryle tells young men, never make a close friend with anyone who is not a friend of God. Never be satisfied with friendship of anyone who will not be useful to your soul. And so many of us could stand up and say, yes, I know from experience how impoverished my soul became when I entered into this relationship with this friend. And some of them can say, hear me when I tell you how enriched my soul has been by entering into friendship with this man or woman. You know it. Your friend's taste become your own. Their virtues become your own. Their vices become your own. It's easier to catch sickness than health, is it not? I see this as a, as a high school and middle school teacher all the time. I see godly kids elevate others. And I see worldly kids bring down others. 
Listen to Ryle once again. Do you ask me what kind of friends you should choose? Choose friends who will benefit your soul. Friends whom you can really respect. Friends whom you would, not, you would like to have near you on your deathbed. Friends who love the Bible and are not afraid to speak to you about it. Friends that you would not be ashamed of having at the coming of Christ and the day of judgment. The Apostle Paul surrounded himself with Christian friends. Good Christian friends. And I would urge you from the youngest to the oldest to follow his good example. Note the importance of friendship. Note, fifthly or sixthly, I've lost my numbers because I got them wrong in my manuscript. Note the notables. Though everyone in this section has a remarkable story, there are two people I want to point out to you as particularly noteworthy because Paul does. One is Epinetus. And what is so special about him? This is so interesting. What is so interesting about Epinetus? He was the first convert to Christ in Asia. This is really interesting, I think. It's a special honor. When I was in seminary, I went to school with a guy named Ajahn Palme, who was from Imphal, India. So if you think of India, which is a huge country, think of north and think of east. And if you ever got to know Ajahn, he would tell you, probably within about five to ten minutes, proudly that he was the grandson of the first Christian convert in that part of India. That, that was something that was important to him. He wanted to share that information. Now he currently serves there as a pastor. But he would tell you that, that, that he is the grandson of the first convert to Christianity in that part of India. It was a special honor for him. His grandfather, so far as we know, was the first convert to Christianity in thousands of years. Perhaps since the days of the Apostle Thomas. Now that part of India is more than 40% Christian, which makes it roughly equal to the Hindu population. See, Ajahn's grandfather was the first fruit of a much larger harvest. And that's what Eponidas represents. The first fruit of a much larger harvest. And I think Eponidas is interesting because we know that that's where Paul wanted to go, right? In the book of Acts, he wanted to go to Asia. But do you remember what happened? Bad luck? No. Bad weather? No. He was hindered. Not by God's enemy, but by God himself. So here is this man that he met who's the first convert to Christ in Asia and Paul had nothing to do with his conversion. He was hindered from going there. And I think it's just great for us to stop and remember, friends, that just because you aren't doing the work doesn't mean that the work's not getting done. Right? The Lord is dependent on no human instrument. He can use Paul to work in Asia. He can use Paul not to work in Asia. But either way, the work goes on. The gospel seed was sown. The first fruits were gathered. Then came the full harvest. Then there's another notable that I want you to meet, and that is Rufus. We know so much about Rufus, it's unbelievable. Rufus was a remarkable man. Look at his name. Look at his nickname. This is the kind of nickname you want in the Bible. It's like Barnabas, son of encouragement. Here's perhaps the better nickname. Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Now you just need to stop and think about that as a Reformed believer. Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Greek, Rufon ton electum. Latin, Rufum electum. Maybe a more literal English translation would be elect Rufus. And this raises all sorts of questions for us, doesn't it? Like, like how could he know? How does Paul know? How can he say that? Aren't all these other faithful brothers and sisters elect too? Why doesn't he refer to them that way if he refers to him like that? The short answer is, I do not know. But here's what I do know. This verse reminds me and you that it is possible to make your calling and election sure. That's what Peter says. He actually commands you to make your calling and election sure. And Rufus... Unless Paul, God gave him some sort of spiritual insight into Rufus' soul that we know nothing about, Rufus made his calling and election sure. So Paul can say, and that man is elect Rufus. It can be done. It must be done. Friends, you can have assurance. It'll cost you something. You've got to fight for it. You've got to fight against sin. It won't come without growth and grace. It won't come without personal holiness. It won't come without regular and faithful use of the means of grace. 
But apart from divine revelation, Paul was as sure of Rufus the same way you can be sure of anyone by the fruit of their life, by a lively faith, by deep repentance, and by growing holiness. Rufus was a man who looked chosen. May God make us men and women who look elect. Not because someone has mystical insight into our souls, but because of our faith, our repentance, and our godliness. Notice the man. Secondly, notice his family. Notice his mom. Paul specifically mentions Rufus' mother. And what a godly woman she must have been. A mother to elect Rufus and an adoptive mother to the Apostle Paul. She's a mother to me. Obviously, it's a term of of deep affection. Notice he doesn't say, and sister so-and-so. He talks about Sister Phoebe, but not Sister Rufus' mom. He calls her mother to me. At the very least, it means unusual care and deep affection, but I think it means more than that. Matt's group has been studying through the book of John. I think you're still in the book of John. Uh, In John 9, we meet a man born blind who comes to faith in Christ. And what happened to that poor man born blind who came to faith in Christ? Was he welcomed and embraced by his community? No. Kicked out of the synagogue. Kicked out of his community. Kicked out of his home. He was disowned and disinherited. And have you ever considered that something similar happened to the Apostle Paul? Consider how much time and money it would have been involved in creating a Paul. You have to have money to send him to Jerusalem to go study with Gamaliel. Right? It's not a public school where you just live in the right place and you go to this teacher. Right? No, this money had to be laid down. Plans had to be made. Sacrifices were required to send Paul to study with Gamaliel in Jerusalem. That's how you became a great Pharisee like that. So don't you know that his family was furious over his own conversion? Think about this. Paul never mentions his own mother or father. Never mentions siblings. Does that mean he doesn't have them? Does that mean they're not living? No, I believe... They were living. I believe they did kick him out of his family after his conversion. It's also worth noting, I think in conjunction with this, is that every word of the New Testament in which the doctrine of of adoption comes from, comes from one person. Comes from the Apostle Paul. He is the apostle of adoption as much as any other truth. In fact, this doctrine is almost unique to him. Not absolutely so, but nobody talks about adoption like Paul. Because I think Paul experienced adoption in Christ, for sure. But perhaps he experienced adoption with Rufus' mother as well. I think that's perhaps one of the reasons why Paul's relationship to Rufus' mother was so profoundly important to him. That he speaks of her as mother and no one else in the Scriptures. You know, ladies, as you think about what you can do as a believer in the church of Christ, you can be this. Not pastor, but Rufus's mother. You can be a spiritual mother, a second mother, an adoptive mother to other people. You understand that, right? This is, this is an, an, a, an option available to you. you know, I'm right, reminded of one of the great characters, maybe one of the greatest characters in The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. He says this of the great lady. Every young man or boy that met her became her son. And every girl that met her was her daughter. Her motherhood was of a different, otherworldly kind. A thousand liveried angels lackeyed her. You, know, you don't even have to be a mother to be this kind of mother. It is within the grasp of every godly and mature woman, married or single, With children or without. We see Rufus the man. He's remarkable. We see his mom. Remarkable. But what about Rufus' father? Do we know him? We do. We know his father. 
and his father was known to the Roman church. Mark wrote about him. Mark named him. Mark did so because the Gospel of Mark was originally written to the church of Rome, and they would have known him and Rufus. So if you have your Bible with me, turn to Mark 15, 21. This is where we meet Mark's, excuse me, Rufus's dad. You know his name already, and you don't even realize it. Mark 15, 21. Here you can find Rufus' father. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus. To carry his cross. Rufus' father was the one who carried our Lord's cross. It's, it's stunning. It's a remarkable connection. Right? For every other believer in the world, cross bearing is a metaphor. But not for Rufus' dad. He actually did it. It's a moving connection, but it's more than that fact. And I do hope it moves you, because it is a, a beautiful picture of a, of a remarkable family we know so much about, and yet most of us are so unaware of it. Rufus's dad carried our Lord's cross, the cross that he was actually nailed to, the cross that he actually died upon, the cross he really and truly, in space and time, made full atonement for our sins. Rufus was a real son. Simon was a real father. Christ is a real Savior. Hear me. Christian truth, as G.K. Chesterton puts it, is not just eternal truth, which it is, but it's external truth. You can see it in space and time and history. The Gospels are not myth and legend. They are history and fact. Written by people at a time who knew the actual people involved. Including the very one who carried the cross of Christ. Note Rufus and his remarkable family. Finally note the point. There is a point here. Not just a great list of names. I know the body of the letter is done. But Paul's not done teaching. This, this greeting drives home some of the main points Paul has been teaching us in Romans 1-15. to Consider the diversity of this church. 18 Greek names. 8 Latin names. 7 Jewish names. 9 women. Probably as many slaves based on what we know about common Roman slave names. And it's likely that two, Aristobulus and Narcissus, were members of Nero's imperial household. When Paul said Jew and Greek, male and female, free and slave are all one in Christ, he wasn't kidding. Right? The conditions, if you think about this list, if you think about how diverse this list is, the conditions, as we've been saying, are perfect for division. And Satan knows it. And don't you know he can turn that screw over and over again because they are so, so diverse and so, so different. And he wants to teach them and us to think of sameness as goodness. If you put diverse believers together in the same church, the potential for division is real. But the conditions are also ripe for agape, for brotherly love. It all depends on your perspective. One last time, friends. One last time. We're done with this for a while. One last time. How do you see our differences? How do you see them? Is this a recipe for disaster or a recipe for love? Our differences exist. They exist by design, by purpose. God in His providence brought this group, diverse group of people together at this time, in this place, to worship and serve God and one another. 
This is not by chance. There is purpose behind it. And that purpose is God's glory. It's not a platitude. He really does get more glory from churches that are different. Churches that are diverse, that express their ultimate unity in Christ despite those differences than He does when everybody's just the same. That's what He's been teaching us in Romans 1-15. to Now do you see why He's pressed so hardly how bad the Jew, Gentile, weak brother, strong brother divisions are? The list of names lets us know the conditions for divisions are perfect, but so is perfect love. Do you note the ultimate unity of the church? Paul tells us about their ultimate unity. You can't see it in their names. You can't see it in their occupations, their ethnicities, their genders, their social strata. It's not in their affluence or personal taste either. Where do you find their unity? What do they have in common? You see it in this three-word phrase, in Christ or in the Lord. It occurs ten times in this section, in Christ or in the Lord. This greeting is a living, breathing illustration of of what Spencer read for us earlier today. And what Paul's been teaching us about in Romans 1-15 to for the last few weeks and months. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. For you are all one in Christo. In Christ. And Paul wants us to express that oneness in an awkward and uncomfortable way. By kissing. That's what he says. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now you may be thinking to yourself, that's just what they did. And if you think that, that would be wrong. There is no evidence whatsoever that the Greeks or the Romans normally greeted each other in this way. Now this is unique. It's unique. It's unique to the Christian church. It is a greeting that is too close for comfort. It is intimate. It is affectionate. It is a powerful picture of brotherly affection. So Paul commands it, and Peter commands it. Justin Martyr tells us that it became an official part of the church's liturgy. He says this, finishing prayers, we greet each other with a holy kiss. That's what they did. They kissed after praying. Tertullian gave it a name, called it the kiss of peace. Hear me, friends, when I tell you That brotherly love is not easier for them than it is for us. Have you read Mark 7? Do you know how gross Jews thought Gentiles were? Do you know they wanted to to, 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 to not walk in their towns, not go in their markets? If they happened to bump in one in the wrong place, what would they go home and do? Take a bath. I'm not kidding. That's why they washed their hands in Mark 7. Not because they knew about microbes. They just didn't want to get Gentile filth on them. That's why Peter was so reluctant to share the gospel with Cornelius. Because he was a Gentile and he had to go into his stinking home. The Lord had to rebuke him and sent him there and he was converted. This wouldn't have been easy for Jewish believers. It wouldn't have been easy for Gentile believers either, believe it or not. Gentiles were very conscious of their status. Their clothes indicated their status. Everything they wore, their dialect even indicated their status. Would it be normal or customary for a member of the imperial household to kiss a slave or a Jew? No. Totally unknown, totally inappropriate, completely unique. But why? Why this gesture? Why not just wave? Isn't it obvious? It gives expression, physical expression, to the oneness of believers and their affection for each other. It's a tangible, personal expression of agape. Brothers and sisters, I've got good news for you. We can express the same thing in a different way. And we must express the same thing in a different way. Our unity in diversity, our unity in Christ, must find real concrete expression in our midst. Because if it's unexpressed, I think Paul would say, it's probably unreal. 
And maybe our real problem with the holy kiss isn't the sign itself. Most of you are more than comfortable kissing filthy animals like dogs and cats. Maybe the holy kiss seems so strange to us because we're strangers to sincere love. Has your love for your fellow church member become more sincere and less hypocritical since we began looking at Romans 12? Have you become less proud or more? Less quarrelsome or more? Less affectionate or more? Oh, friends, the kiss isn't our problem. Our love is the problem. And here at the end of the greeting, Paul summons them at us one last time to stir up and express our sincere love for each other. That's the piano. These are the cards. And they are treasures. May the Lord help us to live in light of these truths. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the diversity of your word, for the diversity of your church. We give you thanks for this greeting section, which at first glance seems almost superfluous, almost unnecessary, just a relic of history without much to say to us. So Lord, we see how wrong we are when we assume that apart about any part of your word. Oh Lord, thank you for the challenge. Thank you for the example of these of these believers, these real people who loved you and served you so many years ago. And in your providence, you have recorded things about them to challenge people like us to be more like them. Thank you for Phoebe and her faithful service. We give you thanks for those faithful women in this chapter who served without pastoring in such a remarkable way. We give you thanks for this army of men who took the lead in prayer and praise and worship and did so many remarkable things for you. We give you thanks for the friendships, the close ties that bind. We give you thanks for the notables, for the first convert in Asia, for Rufus and his remarkable family. And we give you thanks for this one last call in Romans to love each other sincerely. Oh Lord, I confess I fall short of this. Indeed, but also in thought and word. So help me by your Spirit to love affectionately and sincerely. Help me to express that unity and diversity, that real sincere love. Maybe not with kisses, but in other ways that are equally practical and meaningful and affectionate. And I pray, Lord, that you would work in our body as we move out of the book of Romans and into other parts of your word, not to forget these truths. But may, by your Spirit, may they dwell richly within us. And they take root in us and blossom in all sorts of remarkable ways so that we might be a body that brings you great glory because of what Jesus has done for us. We ask this for his sake. Amen. Now is the time in the service where we come to the Lord's table and we remember, we remember the very thing that Rufus' dad participated in carried our Lord's cross.